quarters now. Oh, Good afternoon. I am here from the Lyceum to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Before I do that, I would like to call attention to this image on this t-shirt, which is one taken from one of the murals, and it is a product of the Friends of the Library, and you can purchase these t-shirts in assorted sizes. Having said that, I will go on to the introduction. Um, I'm, a, the, I'm the Lyceum, not the Friends. I'm just being nice. <laughs> Lisa Malin has 17 years' experience in the conservation of oil paintings for government agency, private institutions, and individual clients in the U.S. and Canada. In 2007, she established Malin Conservation in Essex. She has a BA in Art History from Williams College and a Master of Conservation with a specialization in paintings from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And without further ado, Lisa Mela. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you to everybody for coming, digging your cars out and being here. Um, I'm going to do sort of a romp through the history of the building where these murals are located, a little background on the murals themselves and the WPA murals in Gloucester. And then I'm gonna get into a Q&A, which will be the fun part, where I'm gonna show different images from around, the, from the murals that are parts of Gloucester that I'll ask if anybody can identify, okay? And then I'll get into some of the conservation and I'll take some questions, all right? Um, so, let's see. Um, as far as the specific locations that I'm going to be talking about in the Q&A uh, section of this talk, you have to keep in mind these murals are painted in 1934, so they're stylized depictions of Gloucester in its early days. So the idea was to give the feeling of Gloucester with suggestions of the fisheries and harbor, boats and landings, boat building, clamming, and behind it all an expression of the farm life that helped the pioneers to survive while developing the commercial life of the settlement. So. Without further ado, I'm sure this is working. Okay, so here's the Saunders house for those who aren't familiar with it. And I do recommend if you get an opportunity to walk around the front of the building here uh, to the southern side and take a look at this building from the outside. There's quite a bit to see. Um, it's, a very, um, it's a very interesting building, which I will talk about momentarily. Um, so it has been the home of the Sawyer Free Library since 1884. And um, it's an outstanding example of a mid-century colonial home built in Gloucester. And by mid-century, I mean 18th century. Um, it was built by Thomas Saunders, who's a successful merchant and representative to the Massachusetts General Court. The plans for it were likely acquired from England, as most prominent houses were from that time. It was built to reflect Saunders' success and status in one of the, the grandest dwellings in Gloucester at the time. And it still is, actually. It's also one of the most outstanding representatives of this time period in building in Gloucester. Um, there were seven owners before Samuel Sawyer purchased this for the library. Before that, the library had a series of different locations, including a residence parlor, city hall, and the Baptist church. But as the library grew in popularity and these locations proved unsuitable, it was evident that they needed a permanent location. Samuel Sawyer bought the house from William A. Pugh in 1884 for $20,000, which was a lot of money at the time. Before this, the house went through many owners and two major renovations. Captain John Beach, who was an Englishman, purchased it in 1784 and he added the third story you can see on there and an octagonal observatory on the fourth floor which, is no, which no longer exists, and nor do we have a visual representation of it. But for those history buffs out there and people interested in old houses, there is an example of one of these octagonal observatories from roughly the same time period at the Shirley Eustace House in Roxbury, which was built in 1747 as a seasonal country estate for William Shirley, who were, was the royal governor of the province of Massachusetts Bay before uh, the... Before the uh, country even existed. So that would be an, an, a good example of probably a similar octagonal structure. So General Pugh was the seventh owner. Um, he, oh. The seventh owner 
added a four-story Italianate Victorian tower to, the, to this building. The base of the tower exists today, but was reworked in 1934 to its current configuration as the front entry porch. So this is a photo from about 1934 showing the entry porch. That's all that remains of that tower. And here you can see it from outside, and this is what it looks like now. He also added, at the time, piazzas and roof balustrades until it was a Victorian mansion of the highest order, and a few of these elements remain, but not many. Remarkably, though, the house has actually retained some of its original colonial-era features, despite 250 years and eight owners. The front facade is original, and it was built with rusticated board meant to look like dressed stone. It has pedimented window frames, which are original, and that's these um, triangular So you can see here, it has these rusticated boards, pedimented brick window frames, and denticulated cornices, which you can see in the center image. There are also original details on the uh, interior as well, including paneled wainscoting in the center hall on both floors, uh, spiral twist turn balusters uh, in the stairwell, which is the right-hand image there, and those are really amazing. Um, they're all made by hand. So they didn't really have the technology to, to um, use um, laths and things like that that came along later. So those are all, all made by hand. Um, and then there's an arch pilastered compass head window and a pilastered fireplace as well on the first floor. The, the window is on the second floor. But those are all original to the building. Samuel Sawyer um, was born in 1815 and died in 1899. Oops. Um, and he, uh, he came here in the summers and stayed at his ancestral homestead called Brookbank, which is in Freshwater Cove. And so he would stay in Boston from November to March and then come to Gloucester from April to October. And he did that through his entire life. He had started out as somebody who had um, no money at all, and he started as a clerk working at the... Um, uh, Samuel Stevens Dry Goods Store on Main Street in Gloucester. And then he ended up going to Boston and became a salesman with Houghton, Sawyer, and Adams, and entered the field of shipping and commerce, which took him to all parts of the world, where he amassed a fortune as a merchant. He bought the building and donated it to the city to serve as its first free public library, complete with an art gallery filled with paintings personally chosen by him from Europe and Cape Ann, including several F.H. Lane paintings. Um, he also helped with D. Jerome Elwell's European Studies. Some of you may be familiar with him. He was a local Cape Ann artist who was helped by Sawyer. Um, I have read a story that he purchased, Sawyer purchased in 1864, a lane from the Sailor's Fair in Gloucester for $50. So that was a good investment given that it's probably worth between $30,000 and a million dollars now. <laughs> Samuel Sawyer also donated the clock and bell tower for the, the, the clock and bell for the Gloucester City Hall and bought up woodlots to preserve the 600 acre Ravenswood Park, which some of you are probably familiar with. He began a program as well for academic achievement, which is still given to students every year in Gloucester, as many young boys at the time were leaving school to work in the fishing industry and on the wharves. Frederick Stoddard, with his assistant Howard Curtis, painted these murals as part of the Public Works of Art program for the WPA in 1934. He had a long history of mural painting, with sites including the Bell Telephone Company, St. Louis's City Hall, and Odeon Theater, several New York City public school buildings, churches, and homes in various states. He moved to Gloucester in 1922 and held offices at Gloucester Society for Artists and the North Shore Art Association. He painted at least 10 New Deal murals in Gloucester, including Give Us This Day Our Daily Bread for the Central Grammar, which is now at O'Malley Middle School, three panels for Easter Avenue School, and a series of fish and animal murals at the Forbes School. So here's an overview of the largest mural. This is the one in the stairwell, which goes up two stories. 
The upstairs murals were painted in 1970s by Howard Curtis, his assistant, and they showed Gloucester's natural landscapes in the style of his teacher. All right, so here comes the Q&A part. This is the fun part. Okay, does anybody know where this is? You, you can yell out. I think it's down by Spring Street and goes up. Anybody else have an idea? Or Rogers Street. Okay. You just said that Roger Street. Yeah. Past the uh, crow's nest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you look at that stairwell versus the one we just looked at, it actually isn't quite right. The angle isn't right. It's not quite long enough, and the banisters look different. So it's actually. Um, so this is Herrick Court I'm showing here, by the crow's nest, and. It's actually a bluff side stairway near Union Hill. Yeah. So you were right. Um, okay, next one. <coughs> Sorry about the bad quality image on the left. I took it from the internet. So, <laughs> But it is an FH Lane version of a, the same subject matter. The mural image is on the right of um, harvesting uh, salt hay. And um, a low flat boat called a gondola was used and was loaded up with the hay and pulled in from the marshes, or pulled in rather, from the marshes to a point where the tide coming in relieved workers of further labor. So does anybody have an idea where this might have happened? You're really close. So I'll give you another clue. The work with the pole was called fudging and consequently, at the point where the tide took over, they were done fudging. Does that help anybody? Yeah. Okay, we're so done fudging. Just so you know where anyone know where that is? Train By bridge. High school, the train bridge. Train bridge. Yes. So there's still a little shack there, actually, um, called Dun Fudging. And the view from there, one of the views on the top is looking down the river away from the cut bridge. And the other one's looking up towards it, although, of course, the cut bridge wasn't there when the, when the murals were there. Okay, this one's harder. This is a farming scene, and it also shows a boat being built. Now, you don't have a lot to go with here, and I'm sorry the images are, are not great. It, it's very hard to capture this because it's, it, it's a very long mural. But you have boats there, and you have houses in the distance. Does anybody have a clue where this might be? At West Gloucester? I can't hear it. Across the river. Across the river? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Looking towards town. West Gloucester. Little River. Oh, okay. Well, that's possible. I hadn't thought of that. I think, and I may be wrong here, um, I think that it's uh, in Rocky Neck, right by the studio. Because that's the only place I can think of that has buildings visible and that, that would have been built up that much at this time period. But was there any yeah. depth to the soil there so that they could do plowing? Well, that I don't know, because it's all been paved over now. It looks quite different, but if you look at the background, I think the distance of the buildings could possibly be... There you go. Uh, okay, there you go. <laughs> um, okay, so... Oops. So it could have also been at the end of Ferry Street by the hospital. Uh, yes, that's possible as well. Yeah. Oops. That's the only other thing. Hang on. Don't take far. All right, I kind of gave this one away. Um, anybody know where this might be? Okay, now this was very stylized, and, it, and it, I really don't know for sure where this is, but I'm thinking because of the what looks like wharves to the right, I mean um, buildings, that it could be down by Cape Pond Ice. And I think that is possible. And I took a picture of it. I'm not really sure because it's changed so much. Where you would have that many boats all gathered and you have build fairly large buildings on the right. Okay, so this one, everyone knows what this is. Uh, 
but this is very stylized. So the harbor doesn't really look like this, obviously, but there's some telltale signs to show that it's Gloucester. For example, in the lower right um, picture, you see the drying fish. Mm -hmm. um, and then in, uh, on the left-hand image, you can actually see what I believe is um, Stage Fort Park. And at the lower, the, actually it's the upper right picture, looks kind of like Beacon Marine, but I don't mm -hmm. really know. I mean, it's all been jumbled together and the scale is, and subjects are kind of all over the place. Okay, so these are the upstairs murals that are, again, it's a very long mural and I can't really get a good photo of it because of the stairwell. Um, so you can see the signature of H.A. Curtis. Um, it's a big, long, the top left picture is the best uh, image. Does anybody know where that might be? Well, here's another key. If you go all the way down in that far right image, go all the way down to where that desk is, see this. And actually, I should have mentioned there's actually, when you look carefully at the whole mural, you can see a cellar hole in one of the other murals. I didn't get a photo of that, but I should have. Can you go back to that one more time? It's very difficult to see, but it's basically just an open, rocky landscape, and in the in the very far distance, you can see water. Yeah. So it is Dogtown. For sure. Upper left is the distance of hill. Is that West Foster then? I think it's like, you know, Governor's Hill, where Governor's Hill is by the hospital. And it's high. I think, I think so, too. Oh. I think it's Poles Hill. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Right, right. Sorry, Governor's is not. Yeah. Because yeah. there, no, there were no trees, so you could see. You could see really know, far, yeah. And, right you, and you could see hills differently than you do now as yeah. well. Okay, so here's a mystery that I haven't been able to solve. I don't know where this is. <laughs> I've asked several people who have grown up around here and no one seems to know. And it may just be, who knows, it could be just totally stylized. Well, I would guess it's like stylized and that one in the center could be 10 Pound Island and that could be Stage 4 Park Beach. That could be the big hill where the huge rock is. So looking out that way. Oh, like Half Moon Beach kind of area? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yeah. And oh, you're up on an that's elevation true. there. But that's true. houses. There are houses on the in what it's I, ten I think it's there. not. I think it's not very well rendered and the yeah. perspective is, is wrong. I think the houses are meant to be farther away. That's a good guess, though. Um, kind of looks like baby. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um. The guess was uh, Half Moon Beach, kind of looking out towards Ten Pound Island. Is that spot in the right, yeah. is that just a shadow, or is that supposed to be? Yeah, that's the landscape. It looks, it's, it's some kind of a, I think it's a, an island or something. That's what mystified me. So it is painted in with, with trees. It could be Good Harbor. Oh. Some type. Some type. Artistic right, I think it's song artistic song. license yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, so um, on we go. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about here is the, um, the conservation of the murals and the process that I'm using for that. So um, there's a bunch of different things going on with the murals, but mainly there's flaking paint, and it's just the paint itself that's very thin that's flaking, and then there's <coughs> plaster underneath in some other areas that's flaking. And so I'm using two different acrylic adhesives for that. Um, for those chemistry buffs, um, the medium for cons the consolidation is the lighter of the two um, materials that I'm using. It's a low viscosity aqueous dispersion of acrylic copolymer, otherwise known as glue. <laughs> okay. And the other one, the Lasco 303 HV, is a thicker thermoplastic glue. So you can put it into places like where, where the plaster is starting to separate, and then you can iron it down with um, attacking iron and silicon mylar, and it helps to hold the really vulnerable and heavy parts in place. So here's an example. The left hand, this is the top of the stairwell of that big harbor scene. Um, that's what paint looks like in some places. And that would be a case where I would use the thinner glue to go in because I can I can paint it in 
and then iron and then um and then just set it down gently when it's still wet. Um, so um, in the middle picture, I'm basically applying glue into some of these areas where the paint is lifting. And the right hand picture is kind of hard to see, but there's a line through the center. There's actually one half is clean and one half is dirty. And the half that's, that's um, dirty also has lifted paint. And the half on the right that's clean is uh, an area that I set down and also was able to serve as clean. So I can't clean this until it's set, until it's consolidated. <coughs> So these are test patches that I did originally on various areas of flaking. And in the vestibule area, right at the front entrance, that's the worst area as far as the condition of the paint. So I put in a bunch of different adhesives to see what would work best and just did trial and error to figure out a procedure. And that's how I decided which things to use in this case, because there's a whole bunch of choices available to you. So again, here I'm uh, painting in some uh, some of the Lasco, that's the medium for consolidation there. And there's the image on the right of part of it done, part of it not done, just to give you an idea. And the wall is uneven, so it's never gonna look flat. It just is, you don't see those little sort of popcorn chips of the paint that's loose. So as another backup measure where there's some areas where the wall is really crumbling, um, even the Lasco 303 won't work well. And so I use a microcrystalline wax, which is basically, wax is a great material for paintings because it's inert. It doesn't, nothing ever happens to it. Um, it doesn't change, it doesn't darken, and it doesn't become harder to remove as time goes on. And the W445 wax is basically just a high melting point wax. So you don't have to worry about like hot weather changing it. Um, people used to wax line paintings all the time um, back in the day. Everybody wax line paintings. Now it's not really considered um, PC because you can't technically remove it and everything we do is supposed to be removable. Um, but those wax line paintings are just fine 100 years later. I mean, it's really a very good system. But if somebody left a painting in their car, um, they would have some problems when they got back. So, so the next step I'm going to talk about is the cleaning, surface cleaning. Um, so for, again, the chemistry buffs, that's the um, formula for uh, what I'm using, which is ammonium citrate tribasic, or I call it triammonium citrate, which is my uh, cleaning ingredient that I use in distilled water, and then I rinse it with distilled water afterwards. And um, this is just a, a, it's basically a strong chelating agent, which means it picks up positively charged ions, and it's normally used on things like metals, um, but it also is very good on, for removing dirt from surfaces, and actually it's good for removing rust from um, porcelain, things like that, and sculpture. So the surface cleaning has been a real interesting pr uh, project because what I've discovered is there's layers of grime that vary all over the whole surface, but in some places it's really, um, really dirty and you can't even see the colors that should be there and so here I am working on the ladder this is a, a mural uh, I haven't shown you yet of clamors which I believe is somewhere around Lanesville but I don't really know for sure um, and so you can see in the upper left picture that's before I really started doing any work other than the consolidation which I had to do first and then in the um, right hand picture I, it's half cleaned so the bottom half is the colors are just radically different um, with all that grime taken off. Right. That looks like Wayne's house. I think it is. Before they built it the I think it is. I think that I don't know if they clammed there. I didn't know that it was that there was really clamming done. But this is also this these were painted a long time ago and maybe it you know it's changed. Okay, so um, the next step after cleaning is to take the varnish off and these were all varnish in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Um, as to why, I don't really know, but I think when the upstairs murals were done um, and Howard Curtis painted the Dogtown mural, I think he just went over all the murals with varnish because they might have looked sort of, you know, they had been around for 50 years and probably looked kind of dull. And the answer was put a nice shiny coat of Damar varnish on, which is going to look great. Um, and it does look great until it doesn't. And Damar, unfortunately, tends to var uh, yellow and looks terrible. And so. I'm just giving you an example of a uh, 
a painting that has dirty varnish.